Hello everyone. Thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar. I want to thank um, uh, Dave for uh, setting up this Harley Street program despite all the difficult times that we are facing. Uh, sometimes you, know, you need to be thankful for people who uh, try to keep some semblance of normalcy at times of disaster. Uh, so thank you very much uh, Dave for organizing this. And thanks everyone for attending this despite all of your other demands. Um, let me um, take your mind off COVID for the next one hour if I can um, and, and talk to you about uh, treating mood comorbid mood disturbances and psychosis. In particular I'm going to focus on treating depression in the early phase of psychosis. So as you know I am Lena Palaniapan. Uh, I work in the Department of Psychiatry um, at uh, Schulich. Uh, I'm also a scientist attached to the Robots Research Institute um, and the talk that I'm going to give today um, is primarily a clinical talk uh, based on um, my experience as a psychiatrist as well as um, some of the review uh, I've conducted in recent times in this topic of depression in early psychosis. So as an outline I'm going to focus on the importance of uh, comorbid depression and psychosis initially uh, and show you the reasons for why we need to take this seriously. Well, I'll try to illustrate this with a, with a case example. We will then uh, move on to look at the current guidelines. These guidelines are limited, but we'll see what the current guidelines are to treat the comorbid depression and psychosis. And we will then apprise the evidence for what is known and what is unknown in this area. Um, and then even finally, I will wrap up with the 10 take-home points for practice when we try to treat depression in early phases of uh, psychotic disorder. So let's start with the case uh, vignette. So um, a 26 year old woman working at a florist shop was referred to the emergency department for new onset paranoid delusions and auditory hallucinations. The patient claimed that someone is replacing her household furniture with a replica at night as they appear to change in size. She reported hearing voices discussing how to change her clothes and asking her to urinate on her bed. Over the last two months, she stopped going to work and using her bedroom. Her partner noted her being awake at around 3 in the morning and reporting feeling sad and anxious. On presentation, she appeared low in mood and endorsed feelings of hopelessness as well as guilt about not being able to work and placing burden on her husband. She had limited insight regarding her delusions around the furniture. She admitted having had thoughts of ending her life in response to the voices she heard as well as the distress of losing work and having to stay at home where intruders were operating. No notable life events preceded the onset of psychosis and her partner noted no change in her mood prior to this episode. Her father had a diagnosis of schizophrenia but treatment details were unknown. She consulted her family doctor for low mood, suicidal ideas, excess fatigue and crying spells one year ago. This lasted for three months. At this time, she had to reduce her working hours and receive online counseling but refused antidepressants offered by her daughter, doctor. So how do we manage this presentation? So this is a very common presentation in early psychosis teams. Um, a young woman with psychosis as well as some depression. Uh, she has a past history of depression in this case uh, and she hasn't been treated with antipsychotics it looks like. So how, how do we manage this presentation? Now let's start with seeing, looking at you know, how, how, how important it is to manage depression in uh, patients with psychosis. First of all, comorbid psychosis and depression if they are present together, they greatly elevate the suicidal risk. So schizophrenia, as you know, uh, the, the risk of suicide in schizophrenia is around 5%. 5% of patients die by suicide, but around 50% of the patients uh, report self-harm at some point in their life. And if you ask what risk factors increase the chances of uh, a patient with schizophrenia harming uh, himself or herself, the top risk factor is history of depression. So presence of depression um, increases the uh, risk of uh, suicide as well as self-harm um, by around four times 
in patients with schizophrenia. So this is a very important um, uh, issue to look at. This is a meta-analysis by um, McGinty and others in Birmingham. Uh, 96 longitudinal cohort studies on schizophrenia were assembled. Uh, so around 80,000 participants were looked at uh, to predict what are the factors um, involved in uh, increasing the risk of suicide and suicide attempts in schizophrenia and depression is the, the foremost. So it is an important uh, problem to, to tackle if you want to reduce suicidal risk. Not only that, if you ask patients with psychosis, what, are, what symptoms do you want us to treat you with? Treat you, treat you for. Uh, patients um, come up with uh, depression as one of the top symptoms on the list. You know, patients suffer from various symptoms. They suffer from positive symptoms, voice hearing. They suffer from delusions. They suffer from obsessions. They suffer from um, lack of um, uh, clarity in thinking. Uh, many, many features. Anxiety. Many features. But if you ask them, what is the feature they want uh, urgent treatment for? Um, almost inevitably, um, it's uh, symptoms of depression, low self-esteem, lack of drive, and actual depressed mood. Um, so this is a self-reported study uh, from 80 patients with schizophrenia. This was done in Germany, Moritz et al., uh, published three years ago. So not because, not just because of suicidal risk, but also because uh, patients really want, uh, patients' preference is to address depression when they have psychosis. So it's important that we know how to address these symptoms. Now, is depression a rule or an exception in, uh, in early psychosis? Uh, we generally tend to uh, rule out depression and then diagnose uh, a psychotic disorder. Uh, you know, in, in many of my clinical, um, in many of my clinical colleagues' practices, I've seen this repeatedly. In many clinical meetings, I hear this very often. Um, you know, the pa if the patient is depressed, then he doesn't have a psychotic disorder. Um, he probably has more of a depressive disorder or affective disorder and he should not, he, he's not suitable for early intervention work. Uh, in particular, in locally in London, we, we only take non-affective psychosis um, in the early intervention program. Uh, so this is, a, this is a big problem. Um, can you say that a patient doesn't have um, a psychotic illness, uh, even a non-affective uh, psychotic illness such as schizophrenia? Can you diagnose a non-affective psychotic illness by ruling out depression? I think it's uh, it's very difficult. We shouldn't be doing that practice because if you look at the frequency of depressive symptoms, um, if you just ask the question, how common is it to see depressive symptoms in, in patients with first episode psychosis, uh, before the psychotic event, around 83% of patients have depression. During the acute phase of psychosis, around 75% have depressive symptoms. And in the post-psychotic phase, nearly half of the patients continue to have depressive symptoms. So this is only for depressive symptoms. But if you ask the question, how frequent it is that we see clinically significant depression, in other words, depression that requires intervention, uh, still, you know, you get around 57% of first episode patients having clinically significant depression. And more importantly, nearly half of them, one in two of them, will continue to show these depressive symptoms with same intensity uh, even after one year of early intervention. So this is a, a pervasive problem. No, and, and these depressive symptoms uh, are also likely to be non-specific. We need to be uh, mindful that when we say depressive symptoms are highly prevalent, uh, a lot of these symptoms may not be related directly to depression itself. Some of these symptoms overlap with extrapyramidal side effects. Some of these symptoms are related to substance-related dysphoria, and also negative symptoms uh, very significantly overlap with depression. Uh, plus, uh, first episode psychosis may include mood disorders. So. Um, the high prevalence of depressive symptoms may simply be because of various diagnostic conditions being uh, clubbed together in a first episode clinic. Uh, but if you look at first episode schizophrenia, so you diagnose schizophrenia by doing a longitudinal follow-up over time. If you look at the uh, first episode schizophrenia patients specifically, even in that specific, um, you know, very highly defined population, 25% of them have a major depressive episode at the time of inclusion. And if you find out, if you then ask the question, how many first episode schizophrenia patients have a lifetime history of depression? Nearly half of them, like 48% of them, have a lifetime history of depressive episode. So the patient's history that we just reviewed, she's not atypical. She's very typical of uh, the kind of presentation you see in a uh, first episode clinic. And <clears throat> interestingly, one in three of uh, first episode patients who come to an early intervention program uh, have depressive episodes in the preceding year of the first episode schizophrenia. So this is a typical history that we have just seen in our case vignette. Now, 
what, what happens with the um, um, prescription? So if you look at pharmacoepidemiology, uh, it's very clear that um, use of antidepressants is very high when patients receive the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So uh, this is a um, simply a prescription epidemi prescription based epidemiological study. So they just looked at the frequency of uh, prescriptions before and after a diagnosis of schizophrenia, the first episode of schizophrenia. Uh, this is a Finland, Finnish registry, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. This is the Apuranan et al. This is a Finnish registry. Um, and what they showed here is um, zero is the time of uh, making diagnosis, first episode of schizophrenia. And you can see how the rates of prescriptions for antidepressants climbed significantly. Uh, the black line is anti antidepressant prescription. Uh, so by some estimates, around one-third of patients with schizophrenia receive uh, antidepressants. Um, in fact, um, if you even, if you look at specific um, services like early intervention services in, uh, in the U.S. now, the RACE ETP uh, early treatment program, uh, Robinson et al. published um, a detailed review of the pharmacological practices of the RACE ETP program. And they report that 32% of first episode patients receive antidepressants. Only 50% of them receive it for appropriate reasons like anxiety or depression or OCD or uh, suspected schizoaffective illness. Uh, nearly 10% of them receive it as a trial for negative symptoms. Reminding patients receive it, but not for clear uh, reasons. There's no clarity why they receive, but they receive antidepressants um, in first episode clinics. So it's uh, it's not an easy, uh, it's not an uh, unusual um, finding to, to, to see patients receiving antidepressants when they have psychosis. So it's very important, it makes it all the more important that we know um, when to prescribe, uh, why to prescribe, and how to prescribe. So the current diagnostic concepts when people have both depression and psychosis, uh, it's based on um, the idea that if uh, two symptoms are co-expressed, it might mean there is only a one underlying illness, a unitary psychosis model. Um, the current diagnostic concepts are also influenced by the idea of uh, a causal relationship. Um, psychosis could cause depression, so psychosis causes post-psychotic depression. Um, it also gives a uh, place for uh, two diagnoses to be made, comorbidity. So you can diagnose major depressive episode, um, depress depressive disorder, uh, and you can diagnose presence of psychosis on top of it, which is what we call a psychotic depression. So current diagnostic concepts do not follow a single rule for uh, allowing the co-expression of two symptoms. Uh, in fact, they, um, uh, they, are a, they are an amalgam of um, allowing a unitary psychosis model, allowing comorbidity, and allowing causal relationships. What I mean by unitary psychosis is uh, considered schizoaffective illness. It considers a single disorder um, where both uh, mood disorder and, and psychotic symptoms can be present. But these current diagnostic concepts uh, are, are not very helpful, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, but this is the kind of pictorial representation of the current diagnostic concepts. So what you see on top are uh, schizophrenia spectrum and illnesses. And what you see here uh, are effective, more, more effective color, colored illnesses. And, and the red um, wave is psychosis and the blue wave is uh, depression. So in psychosis and schizophrenia, you see psychotic episodes. and you, you can also see depression, but it's not very prominent. In affective disorders, the mood symptoms are prominent, uh, but the psychotic symptoms are subdued. They may be present, but not prominent. In the post-psychotic depression, uh, where depression follows psychosis, you have a temporal relationship. You have a psychotic episode during which you may or may not have some depression, uh, but clearly there is a depressive um, uh, exacerbation after the psychosis. So every time after psychosis, you see a depressive exacerbation in this picture. Uh, and then you also have schizoaffective illness where both conditions are prominent, but they're independent. In other words, depression coexists with psychosis, but you can see depression uh, even in the absence of psychosis um, because it's it's present for um, a large amount of, it's present for the predominant period of time, but you also see psychosis in the absence of um, uh, de depression or mood symptoms in schizoaffective disorder. In fact, presence of Psychosis without more symptoms is a great, is an essential criterion for diagnosing schizoaffective illness. So the current diagnostic approach is not useful for treatment. One of the reasons is the, the current diagnostic schemes, first of all, are not very stable. So if you take psychotic depression, many patients with psychotic depression turn out to have schizophrenia uh, over, over a period of time. So this is a work from um, uh, Bromet and others. Uh, using uh, the New York longitudinal uh, data. So what you see here is um, diagnosis at baseline and then what happens over 10 years with the diagnosis. 
So what you see in red is schizophrenia. So there is a slow increase in number of schizophrenia cases over time. So everybody has um, an admission with psychotic symptoms. And then you are seeing what happens over time. So you can see the number of schizophrenia cases, they build up over time. Uh, and see what happens to the, the little blue uh, bar here, that is psychotic depression, major depression with psychosis. It shrinks. So number of patients diagnosed with, with psychotic depression turn out to have schizophrenia later on over a 10 year period. So that's what is shown in this picture as well here. So you have um, 77 cases of major depression, um, out of which nearly 23 turn out to become uh, turn out to be schizophrenia patients in the same way 126 schizophrenia patients almost all of them 99 of them still stay with the diagnosis of schizophrenia um, and only a small number turn out to have other diagnosis so major depression psychotic depression turns out to be schizophrenia in many cases that's one of the issues with the current diagnostic concept but the other issue is the most common symptom of a relapse in a patient with schizophrenia is not positive psychotic symptom it is depression depression is the most common symptom of relapse in a patient with schizophrenia so this is from the abc schizophrenia study um, led by hafner um, in germany uh, so 333 psychotic relapse episodes were looked at and what they concluded was um, patients had three different types of uh, well this is looking at three different types of symptoms negative symptoms positive symptoms and depressive symptoms and you can see clearly um, in the first psychotic episode as well, depression is prominent. And uh, in the relapses as well, depression is prominent. And depression is the most frequent symptom that you see um, during a psychotic relapse. So you can see that the current concept of having uh, depression as a different disorder from psychosis is not very uh, useful. Uh, because what happens in longitudinal data, if you look at longitudinal data, uh, things seem um, very mixed. Um, this is a, a brain imaging study. I just put it up to explain that it's not simply the, the treatment um, questions which are complicated by the existing diagnostic scheme, but it's also um, brain dysfunction itself. So uh, the diagnostic concepts, brain dysfunction does not follow the diagnostic categories. This is a work where we compared uh, depression, bipolar disorder with psycho, bipolar disorder patients, schizophrenia patients, as well as depressed patients. Not all of them have psychotic symptoms. They all have different symptom profile, but despite that, if you compare uh, what is the uh, what are the degree of uh, disconnectivity in the brain between two between uh, multiple regions of the brain, you, you you get a pattern of disconnectivity that is common across all the three disorders. So this is what you see in the in this panel here, the big circle. Um, all brain regions are listed, and the connections between them, which are abnormal, are also listed. You see a number of disconnections, and these disconnections are common. Um, among schizophrenia, depression, as well as bipolar patients. They, each disease group, each diagnostic group also has uh, its own idiosyncratic specific patterns of disconnectivity. But these specific abnormalities are, are very rare um, compared to the, the commonality that you see among the three disorders. So this is schizophrenia, this is depression, this is bipolar disorder. Yes, there are some disease specific disconnectivities, but most of the disconnectivities are transdiagnostic. So the bottom line is diagnostic constructs as we use them now are not very helpful. But despite that, there are guidelines um, based on these diagnostic concepts. There are 10 national guidelines that discuss managing depression in schizophrenia. So in the four um, comorbid conditions I showed, uh, the guidelines I'm going to discuss now are, are focusing on uh, the, the top two, schizophrenia as well as uh, schizophrenia with depression. So schizophrenia, where uh, patients have psychosis and depression, and post-psychotic depression, where patients have psychotic episodes followed by uh, intense depression. So for this schizophrenia spectrum, uh, there are some studies that are conducted looking at how to treat depression in the schizophrenia spectrum. And there are 10 national guidelines that discuss managing depression in schizophrenia. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, well, they, they, they all been reviewed by um, Donde and others. A nice review was published two years ago in Acta Psychiatrica Scandinavica, looking at all these 10 national guidelines and coming up with uh, what are the consensus uh, consensus recommendations from this. One, one thing is clear, uh, the main issue in managing depression and psychosis is um, there is a lack of RCT-based evidence. Many um, guideline-based recommendations are not based on RCT uh, evidence, they're based on expert opinion and uh, lower quality evidences 
they're not based on RCT. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But if you look at what are the guideline recommendations, you see some specific recommendations which are like common across all the guidelines. Number one, almost all guidelines say that we have to screen and monitor regularly for dep with using depression-specific scales during acute psychosis. They also say that uh, we need to wait for antipsychotic effects to kick in um, and positive psychotic symptoms to resolve before we treat depression in psychosis. And they also say that if first generation antipsychotics are used, we should switch to second generation antipsychotics, but not risperidone um, because of <coughs> its typicality. Uh, and also um, ask, um, um, ask to keep the option of uh, adding antidepressants open uh, if patients are not responding um, with, with a simple antipsychotic intervention. Now, and if antidepressants are needed, um, treat for at least six months. I mean, this is something that we do for depression. So the same recommendation is given. Um, there's also some other recommendations that you can use lithium, uh, but other mood stabilizers and TMS, they're not indicated. So these are basic recommendations from uh, all the guidelines, but there are a lot of questions unanswered from these recommendations. First of all, it's not clear how long to wait. If a patient comes in with both psychosis and depression, how long should we wait? And are there any situations where we should treat the depression without waiting for psychosis to resolve? That's not clear as well. And what if psychosis does not go away with antipsychotic treatment? If the patient um, becomes less depressed but still psychotic, what should we do? Uh, what if um, what if depression doesn't resolve? The, the psychosis goes away. If the patient is still depressed, what should we do? And what agent we should choose to treat? So these questions are not clearly answered by the guidelines, mostly because of lack of data. Uh, so my um, work now is to just take you through what evidence we have for these rec specific recommendations. Um, and then I'm also going to um, guide you uh, through uh, thinking, gu gu guide your thinking through uh, the unanswered questions. So we'll see, you know, how long to treat, uh, what to treat with, uh, and what to do, uh, when not to wait, okay? So let's first start with the recommendations which are clear. So first recommendation is we have to screen and we have to monitor regularly. Uh, with depression specific scales and what scales uh, can we recommend calgary depression scale very easy to use it's a nine item scale and this is the best scale for monitoring um, depression symptoms in schizophrenia it was specifically um, um, prepared for this pur purpose and if a patient uh, you know when you use calgary depression scale if a patient scores more than six uh, you can in you take that to indicate a current major depressive episode in schizophrenia you know, the reason for using this scale is because uh, it avoids overlap with negative symptoms, it avoids overlap with extrapyramidal symptoms, so it makes your diagnosis easier uh, for depression. Um, I will also recommend you to use um, a PANS 6 scale along with a uh, Calgary depression scale. Uh, I will explain to you in a minute why it is important to record uh, you, uh, the psychotic symptom rating as well uh, when you record Calgary depression scale ratings with um, when, you, when you're trying to treat somebody with depression and psychosis. So PAN-6 is an easy scale to use. You have P1, P2, P3, three items of positive symptoms, and it has three items of negative symptoms. Uh, and it's, a, it's scored between uh, 1 and 7, and it's a straightforward scale to use. Now, the second recommendation is wait for antipsychotic effects to kick in. Um, so why, why, where is this recommendation coming from? Now, it's kind of an anecdotal understanding that if you treat patients with uh, psychosis and depression with antipsychotics, many of them uh, show a response in both um, psychotic symptoms as well as in depression. Um, you know, the evidence for this is not, not great, but there are some studies which clearly show um, that there is a, a strong um, uh, rationale behind, uh, behind this recommendation. So, first of all, uh, this is a study uh, done quite a while ago by... Uh, Tandon's group. Um, they're looking at what happens to HAMD scores before and after treatment with antipsychotics in a group of first episode patients. Um, and so what they show here is antipsychotics reduce depression. So this is not a surprise. But what they then did is they looked at the correlation between getting better with depression uh, in terms of HAMD score and positive symptoms, negative symptoms scores as well. So what they showed is there's a strong correlation between positive symptoms getting better and depression getting better. And how strong is the correlation? Around 16% of change in um, positive symptoms is explained by um, uh, is explained by uh, change in, uh, sorry, 16% of change in depressive symptoms is explained by change in positive symptoms. Uh, 
Well, it's not a great degree of variance, uh, but you can see um, how the correlation uh, is present, how it is significant statistically, uh, but there's only 16% of change in depression is explained by uh, change in uh, positive symptoms. Now, what happens uh, if, you, if you assess patients for a, for a longer period of time? What happens with, with the relationship between depression and psychosis? So this is a very nice study done by uh, Moller um, in uh, Germany. So this is the old study. This is a study looking at 72 patients with uh, acute schizophrenia uh, and tr trying to look at the course of depression and acute psychosis. So what the study shows is, you know, patients have variable course. Not everybody get better when you treat psychosis. Not everyone with psychosis, everyone with depression and psychosis uh, do not get better. Only a small person. 41% of initially depressed patients, they show full resolution of depressive symptoms uh, with resolving psychosis. So when psychosis gets better, around 41% of patients show depressive symptoms also getting better. So that's a nice drop here. So this is 22 and you have other, other drops in other sub subgroups as well. 41. But 59% of patients are still depressed at the time of discharge. So they're getting discharged because their psychotic symptoms are much better, but they're still depressed, 59%. So this kind of um, brings the issue that many patients with early psychosis it's not sufficient to just give them antipsychotics um, and wait for psychotic symptoms to get better. It's likely that many patients will require a second line intervention than just watching and waiting for positive symptoms to resolve. That's an important point to keep in mind. The another, another recommendation you see is uh, switching to second generation antipsychotics. Um, it is a bit of a, a you know not very useful recommendation because most of us don't use first generation antipsychotics as first line anymore. Um, so switching to SGA is not a very helpful recommendation. Most of us start with SGAs, um, but you know some second generation antipsychotics are more more, more typical than than atypical. For example, higher doses of risperidone uh, can act more as a, a typical agent. So if you are treating a patient with a high dose of risperidone um, are, a, are a first generation antipsychotic and they're not getting better in terms of their depression, uh, then you, you should be able to consider strongly the option of switching to a second generation antipsychotic with um, antidepressant potential. So it's important to know that uh, atypicals themselves um, may not have a lot of direct effect on depression, uh, at least in schizophrenia samples. So this is a study showing um, difference between olanzapine and placebo. Uh, in uh, improvement of depressive symptoms. Depressive symptoms, when you compare olanzapine and placebo, depressive symptoms improve a lot in olanzapine group. There's no doubt about that. But if you then pass the effects into direct effects, effects secondary to improvement in positive symptoms, and effects secondary to improvement in negative symptoms, you see only 51% of the effects of olanzapine on depression, sorry, only 21% of the effect of olanzapine on depression is due to a direct antidepressant effect. Most of the benefit you get from olanzapine is because of indirect effect on positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Okay, um, but if you switch from first generation uh, haloperidol to olanzapine, uh, of course you get a much more direct effect of uh, uh, of olanzapine. That's because first generation antipsychotics produce a lot of extrapyramidal symptoms as well. So there's a lot of improvement here. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, atypicals themselves do not have a much of a direct antidepressant effect in this situation. This is a, a trial of 335 patients. These are chronic schizophrenia patients, but uh, we can extrapolate the information to uh, first episode psychosis as well. So olanzapine versus placebo and haloperidol. Uh, remember the haloperidol was used in 10 to 20 milligram dose here. So um, this is KT trial. A KT trial looked at many different uh, atypicals and one typical perfanazin. This is look at, looking at the Calgary Depression's Kate score. Um, when you use um, all these different agents. What happens uh, when, when there is a relapse of psychosis in an established schizophrenia patient? Uh, what happens to the Calgary depression symptom scale scores over time when you treat them with antipsychotics? There's no huge difference among the antipsychotics in terms of their effect on CDSs. And this is a um, bit of a depressing result because um, you, know, you expect atypicals to be uh, much better when it, when it comes to depression, but they're actually not. But remember, KT study did not use lorazidone, uh, abilify, aripiprazole, or brexpiprazole. So we don't know if these medications will have a different effect on, on depression. In fact, if you look at lorazidone, 
there has been like four trials uh, all of them are company sponsored trials uh, of uh, 898 and uh, 432 patients uh, on intervention and, and comparator uh, and these trials were meta-analyzed by Henry Nasrallah um, and when you put together all the results of these four trials what you see is among patients with schizophrenia who have a baseline uh, MADRA score of greater than 12 which means they have a clinically significant depression depressive symptom remission can be attained by around 45 percent of patients who take lorazidone uh, compared to only 36 percent who take a placebo so you get an nnt of 11 to 13 for remission of depression with lorazidone in patients with schizophrenia um, and there's no huge variation uh, with severity you know you see uh, people with very high severity also responding as well as patients with uh, lower severity of depression also responding but all of them have clinically significant depression and that's a very important point. So lorazidone may have a, um, a specific effect on depression in, in schizophrenia. It's something to keep in mind. Um, same can be said about brexpiprazole and uh, other new drugs as well. I'm not showing all the data here, but just to make a point that some uh, antipsychotics may have a specific effect. One more uh, guideline point that you see is uh, adding antidepressants. Uh, adding antidepressants is recommended uh, if antipsychotics themselves are not useful so uh, where does this uh, where is the evidence for adding antidepressants come from especially in the first episode of psychosis where is the evidence coming from now there are no uh, direct trials of treating depression in first episode schizophrenia uh, not you know there is no direct evidence focused on effect of antidepressants on depression uh, especially when the depression is clinically significant in first episode schizophrenia but there has been trials looking at the effect of antidepressants on other symptoms such as weight gain, um, weight gain, negative symptoms, etc. So this is one such study conducted by uh, Poyurovsky in uh, Israel. Um, this study showed that when you add fluoxetine to olanzapine, not a great deal of benefit is seen. Uh, but the study used only 20 milligrams of fluoxetine. Uh, the same group followed this work up and uh, repeated this uh, this design, but this time they used 4 milligrams of riboxidin, uh, added to 10 milligrams of olanzapine, and they actually showed this was beneficial for depression. They followed this work up in a larger trial with 60 patients and confirmed that riboxidin had a specific um, beneficial effect when added to olanzapine for depression. But remember, both of these studies were not focused on depression. They were looking at weight gain and as a ancillary secondary outcome they were reporting on depression and depression seemed to improve you know, when these treatments were added riboxidin was added to lanzapin now the only specific trial that i know which looked at uh, effect of an antidepressant in first episode patients uh, is uh, the trial called decipher now remember this trial did not look at clinically significant depression it looked at non-major depressive episode but um, depressive symptoms are positive which, which means in Calgary depression scale uh, patients are scoring less than seven and you select those patients and then you give them antidepressant citalopram in addition to um, the usual antipsychotic that they are taking and then see what happens it's a 52 weeks trial so this is pretty impressive uh, it's a long trial 20 to 40 milligrams of uh, citalopram um, and uh, patients had first episode of schizophrenia but they had exposure to antipsychotic for 4 to 24 weeks before entering this trial. Um, 95 patients, 52 completed the study. Uh, what they saw in the study was negative symptoms reduced when you added citalopram. But depression uh, did not improve that much. In fact, depression improved much better in patients who took placebo. So this box here is the depression data. So at the end of the study, depression was uh, significantly uh, improved in, uh, much better, improvement in depression was much better in the placebo group, the blue one, compared to the red one. But negative symptom improvement was much better in the um, uh, drug treatment group compared to the um, placebo group. So um, this is um, uh, somewhat surprising, but what it tells you is substandromal depression in first episode schizophrenia may not improve with antidepressants. So do not use antidepressant to treat uh, substandromal depression, which is scoring less than seven in a uh, Calgary depression scale. Um, so this is Goff et al. Uh, you can see in the schizophrenia research that was published last year. And the same kind of message also comes from a meta-analysis published uh, the year before in ACTA by Galling and others. Subsyndromal depression will not improve with SSRIs when people have psychosis, especially when they have first episode schizophrenia. Um, 
if you look more broadly into um, to to look at the data on any uh, phase of psychosis, um, not just first episode, any phase of psychosis, just look at antidepressant trials in uh, all stages of schizophrenia. A very nice meta-analysis published by Helfer and others uh, from Stefan Light Group um, a few years ago, 2016, looking at the effect of adding antidepressants on various symptoms of schizophrenia. A very impressive meta-analysis. Nearly 128 studies with 82 randomized control trials uh, were included. So the, the major result for the study is you know, if you add antidepressants, um, they reduce depressive symptoms uh, in patients with schizophrenia. Uh, they also improve negative symptoms, they also improve positive symptoms, and they improve the overall quality of life. This is very interesting. Um, and they're well tolerated. There's no exacerbation of psychosis. There's no increase in dropouts when you add antidepressants. So this is a very interesting meta-analysis. If you look a little closely and find out um, what are the specific uh, messages we can infer from this meta-analysis, you can see that sertraline emerges to be the superior agent when it comes to individual agents. So uh, if you look at agents that have more than one trial, so you can see sertraline, um, and then you have sertraline here, four trials. Sertraline clearly is a significant drug, a significant, um, sertraline trials are significant. Uh, they are clearly helpful to treat depression in patients with uh, schizophrenia. Uh, and what kind of patients, uh, what kind of patients get better? Now, it's not easy to answer the question with a meta-analysis, but if you look at the kind of trials where patients are showing improvement when antidepressants are added. These trials generally include patients with treatment-resistant schizophrenia or they include stable non-first episode patients with pronounced depressive symptoms uh, baseline. So those are the patients who show better response. First episode patients don't show that good response when you add antidepressants. Well, at least the, the number of trials, uh, only three trials, which I discussed earlier, the Podgorovsky trials, and uh, now you have Decipher trial as well. All of them say the same thing. In first episode, you don't have a, a brilliant response to antidepressants. But clearly you have, um, in later stages of illness, you clearly have a better response and certainly may be a good agent. Okay, so those are the questions, uh, you know, for which we have um, uh, a guideline, um, which we have some, you know, we, we reviewed the evidence for the uh, recommendations. Now, uh, let's just ask the questions that are unanswered. So when should we not wait? Now, mood congruent psychosis, when people have psychotic symptoms which are congruent with the mood uh, during the initial presentation, that indicates an affective illness trajectory. Uh, so what do you mean by mood congruence? If patients have themes of personal inadequacy, guilt, um, hypochondriacal delusions, death, um, delusions related to nihilism, uh, delusions of punishment, uh, these are mood congruent and they, they suggest that patients may have an affective illness-like trajectory. Um, in fact, lack of incongruence is more important than presence of congruence. Um, so if, the, if there is no uh, incongruent psychotic symptoms, it's very likely the patient's symptoms are suggestive of an affective illness course. Um, and in that case, you have to treat this like psychotic depression. And there's a meta-analysis of uh, various randomized controlled trials of psychotic depression, which suggests that you have to add both antipsychotic and antidepressant to treat this. So if you see mood congruence, um, you, have to, uh, you have to introduce antidepressants without waiting for too long. Uh, that's the only way to control the symptoms quickly, even if it's a first episode. Um, and then if the patient presents with a past depressive episode, so major depressive episode in the past, and currently the patient has psychosis as well as major depressive episode, clearly there is a recurrence of depression. So recurrent depression, recurrent depressive condition needs to be treated with an antidepressant because once you have the second episode, you're going to have a third, a fourth, and a fifth. So it's very important to uh, treat with antidepressants. So two indicators for not to wait will be a presence of mood congruent uh, features and past history of a clearly documented history of a major depressive episode in, a, in an early psychosis patient before the psychosis onset. Next question is how long should we wait? I mean, this is a challenging question to answer um, because there is no randomized controlled trial evidence how long we should wait. But we can extrapolate some evidence from uh, simple randomized controlled trials of antipsychotics in schizophrenia. So if you look at antipsychotics and how long it takes for antipsychotics to work on psychotic symptoms in schizophrenia, most patients, most of the symptom control happens in the first four weeks. Uh, this, is, this is called the early onset hypothesis of antipsychotic action, promoted largely by Ofor Agid uh, uh, from Toronto, Kamaj, and Robin Emsley in uh, South Africa, Stellenbosch. 
So what do these uh, studies suggest? This, this data is from Robin Emsley. And what do these data suggest? Um, first week, second week, third week, and fourth week, uh, weeks of treatment. And this is the um, percentage of people who show a defined response. In this case, response is defined as more than 20% drop in PAN score, PAN's total score. So uh, by four weeks, you can see around 80% of patients are showing what you can call as a response. So I would say, you know, waiting for four weeks is, is a prudent wait. And if you if you don't see any response in, in the positive symptoms in four weeks, uh, you cannot expect a response to depression as well in four weeks. But in first episode schizophrenia, the, the time it takes for a response to antipsychotics is a little variable because titration takes time. Uh, you, you start slow, uh, you start low and you go slow. Um, also, patients keep responding cumulatively over time uh, because first episode groups are a, a combination of early responders as well as delayed responders. Uh, in, when it comes to uh, established illness with schizophrenia, you, you already have diagnosed. So you are uh, somehow filtering patients who are having a sort of a medium median uh, response rates. But in early, uh, in early first episode psychosis, some people will respond very quickly within days and some people will, will have delay. So in our own data, this is a paper that just got published today, uh, 24th of March. Uh, and in this paper, um, this is primarily a meta, this is primarily a spectroscopy paper. Uh, but here we report some clinical information about um, the time it takes for people to respond to antipsychotics in uh, first episode psychosis. Uh, in fact, this is first episode schizophrenia and schizoaffective illness together. It takes around six weeks uh, in our first episode schizophrenia sample for patients to respond to antipsychotics. So what I would suggest is instead of uh, you know waiting for uh, four to six weeks, uh, it will be important for us to look for the correlation between uh, improvement in psychosis and improvement in depression. If there is any dissociation, for example, if depression is not improving but psychosis is improving, then that suggests that we need to act and treat depression separately from psychosis. Uh, so this is why I mentioned earlier that it's important that we use um, Calgary Depression Scale as well as a PAN-6. So we have um, a baseline measurement of both depression as well as the positive psychotic symptoms. And then we can reapply these uh, scales at fourth week, uh, fifth week, sixth week to see if there is a correlation between change in uh, CDSs and change in PANs. If there is no correlation, then we have to think about uh, intervention for depression separately. So... What if psychosis uh, doesn't resolve or what if depression doesn't resolve in four to six weeks time? So if PANS and CDSs both show no improvement, that means your antipsychotic is not working. You've got to switch the antipsychotics. Um, if PANS is showing an improvement, uh, but CDSs is showing no improvement. In other words, if psychosis is getting better, but depression still stays, you've got to think of antidepressants. You have to also think of non-pharmacological strategies to treat depression. What if uh, depression gets better with anti antipsychotics, but psychosis is still present, prominent psychosis is still present? Now, this is when you have to consider a revisit your diagnosis. You have to think more in terms of a schizoaffective disorder in this condition. Um, so, uh, well, I'll explain that in, a, in, a, in the next slide, but uh, let's first look at the non-pharmacological strategies. Um, I'm, not dealing, I'm not going to talk in detail about CBT and other interventions, but clearly... Uh, you have a role for um, CBT as well as uh, interven psychosocial interventions like uh, physical activity and depression uh, and exercise. Exercise reduces depression and schizophrenia. And this is a meta-analysis by Minakshi Dawan um, in the Netherlands. And this meta-analysis clearly shows that um, there is a, a, not only a statistically significant but also a clinically meaningful effect when um, patients do exercise, uh, both aerobic uh, yoga exercise and anaerobic exercise as well. So any form of physical activity will improve, uh, will help you to treat depression in, in psychotic patients. So it's not something that we can easily ignore um, given the accumulating evidence. What if psychosis doesn't improve, but depression improves when you introduce antipsychotic? So this is a patient who's having a, a onset of symptoms, say in January, um, coming to your attention by around May. Uh, this is the usual trajectory. People don't seek treatment immediately. So you first see the patient, the patient has psychosis, psychosis red, the patient also has depression. You treat the patient with uh, anti-psychotic, uh, D2 antagonist. Um, you give it for a month, four weeks to six weeks. The depression goes away, the patient is not 
depressed at the end of the treatment, end of the four to six weeks, but the psychotic symptoms are still prominent. So what happens over time then is the, the psychotic symptoms are present for nearly around, uh, at least around uh, two, two weeks without any mood symptoms, without any prominent mood symptoms. So let's say this patient has um, another episode of depression at some point later on with or without psychosis. Clearly this patient has um, a, a significant um, portion of their uh, illness trajectory spent in, in, in the mood episode. So they're depressed for most of the time. They also have psychosis without depression for a period of time. Just likely this patient has what, what we call a schizoaffective disorder, which requires a different line of thinking for management. You have to consider mood stabilizers, you have to consider lithium. So I'm not going into I'm not going into details about how to manage schizoaffective disorder here. But it's important that if we give anti antipsychotics, if the depression goes away, but if psychosis doesn't, it's important to consider the diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. Okay, so that brings uh, um, brings me to the final session, uh, final part of my, my talk. So what are the 10 rules for treating depression? I think I laid out the evidence for the current guidelines as well as um, the evidence for um, the unanswered questions, uh, how we can think differently about the unanswered questions. So what I would say is if you are treating a patient with both psychosis and depression, early psychosis and depression, the first step when they present, you assess for mood congruence. If the patient has mood congruent features in delusions and hallucinations, um, you, you need to think of treating it as psychotic depression. Um, then you look for history of past episode of major depressive, uh, major depressive uh, episodes, the past history of major depressive episodes. If there is a past history of major depression, um, it's important not to wait and start treating the patient's um, condition with an antidepressant as well as antipsychotic. Um, Quantify uh, depression with the CDSS scale. Document if the patient satisfies major depressive episode criteria because almost all the evidence suggests that uh, subsyndromal depression should not be treated in early psychosis with antidepressants. So then initiate antipsychotic treatment first, preferably an SGA with an antidepressant effect, SGA like lorazidone or uh, other, other SGAs with uh, less typicality. Uh, four to six weeks, repeat CDSS, repeat PANS and see uh, if there is a divergence. If there's a divergence, you know what to do. And I showed you that slide earlier. I'll show it again. So um, what should you not do? Do not treat subthreshold depression with antidepressants. There's no evidence for that. Do not stick to your diagnosis. Uh, be ready to revise your diagnosis. Uh, Skews affective illness may, uh, may become apparent only after you start treating somebody with a comorbid psychosis and depression with an antipsychotic. Do not ignore the non-specific effects of antidepressants. The antidepressants are uh, very helpful for treating negative symptoms as well as um, uh, uh, general uh, symptom improvement in uh, treatment resistance schizophrenia as we saw in the half non meta analysis so you know don't don't um, um, avoid antidepressants uh, simply because of a lack of evidence um, in the first episode of schizophrenia uh, you may want to use antidepressants for other benefits uh, in treatment resistance uh, also to treat negative symptoms uh, do not ignore psychosocial interventions. I highlighted only the evidence for exercise, but CBT is very important when it comes to treating depression and uh, psychosis. And again, I did not expound this further, but do not forget clozapine for a suicidal patient. Clozapine has a specific role to play in a suicidal patient, and I highlighted earlier that depression is one of the risk factors for suicide. So if you see depression and psychosis together, and the patient is not responding to your conventional interventions, clozapine has a very important role to play. So I want to finish by thanking uh, well, my spouse, uh, Priyadarshini Sabazin, who is also an urgent care psychiatrist. She helped synthesize the trial evidence for this talk. Um, also the TOPSI study team, I showed one of the uh, results from our own group. And that's primarily uh, data gathered by Dr. Dempster, Kara Dempster and Michael McKinley, who's a PhD student in our, in, in our, lab, in our lab. Also, uh, uh, Kang, Kang Lu, Chang Lu, uh, he's, uh, he's in Shanghai. Chang is a... Um, Neuroscientist, uh, he's the one who primarily uh, compiled all the trans diagnostic imaging data for us. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll take some questions now.